Good morning, and welcome to Plymouth United Church of Christ in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and our online worship service. Whether you are with us today in worship as a member, friend, or visitor, we hope that you find a welcome here. Please join in our responsive call to worship. Come, come and worship. You who woke early and you who slept late. You who come often and you who do not. Whether we are first or last or somewhere in between. There is room for all of us in God's kingdom. And more than enough grace to go around. Let's worship God together. Please join several members of our chancel choir in singing our opening hymn, Guide Me, O My Great Redeemer. confession. It seems we cannot decide, God of glory. We say we will live to serve others, but end up meeting only our own needs. We claim to live in a way that honors Christ, but we do not take Jesus with us to work or school or home. Forgive us, presence of peace, instead of grumblers, May we be ambassadors of grace. Instead of continual complaining, may we carry compassion to the hurting. Instead of whiners, may we be workers with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to reach out and bring the kingdom of God to everyone we meet. Amen. Here. 
Hear these blessed words of assurance. This is the good news. There is no ranking in God's kingdom. God graces everyone with the same gifts, mercy, restoration, new life. God has kept the covenant. We have been forgiven. We have been made new people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join in our sung response, Ale Ale. Here the first scripture reading from Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15, where we hear the story of the Israelites complaining to Moses about not having any food in the wilderness and how God provided for their needs. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked towards the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Please join in our responsive reading of Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to God. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing, Sing to God. God. Sing, Sing praises, praises to God. God. Tell of all God's wonderful works. works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek God rejoice. 
Seek God and God's strength. Seek God's presence continually. Remember the wonderful works God has done, God's miracles and the judgments God uttered. O offspring of God's servants, Abraham and Sarah, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. Then God brought Israel out with silver and gold, and there was no one among their tribes who stumbled. Egypt, Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread, dread of them, them had fallen upon Egypt. Egypt. God spread a cloud for a covering, and fire to give light by night. They, they asked, and God, God brought quails, and gave them food from heaven in abundance. In abundance. God opened the rock, and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river. For God, God remembered God's holy promise, and Abraham and Sarah, God's servants. So God brought God's people out with joy, God's chosen ones with singing. God gave them the lands of the nations, and they took possession of the wealth of the people that they might keep God's statutes and observe God's laws. Praise be to God. Our third scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Hear the parable of the laborers in the vineyard as told by Jesus. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. May we all be blessed with understanding. Here end the reading for the day. Sometime this summer, my partner and I decided that we were feeling pretty good in a couple of areas of our life, and so we thought we should eat better. After a few days of not eating particularly well, and so based on the best research I could possibly do on Facebook, we started a keto diet. And honestly, it's not really, it doesn't really matter what we could or couldn't eat. It mad, what mattered was that it took planning every single day at the beginning of the week, of every meal and every snack, and then we had to weigh everything to make sure it measured out perfectly. And it meant at the end of the day, if we hadn't met all of our microbe numbers, we had to eat more to fill them. And for us, it was absolutely absurd. And no offense if this is the way that you live your best life, but it wasn't ours. We grumbled and complained and cheated and have since 
moved on to hopefully more successful pastures of eating. And we, we all are people of the quarantine in Plymouth, I miss your faces this morning. And in the earliest days, which could have been a decade ago, or yesterday, who can really tell anymore? There were those who gathered and marched in protest because for them the cost was too great to stay home, to close businesses. The goals of safety and health and flattening the curve were too obscure, too unobtainable for the costs, and so here we still are. Grumbling has connected our summer, and grumbling connects our stories today. Jesus tells the parable that the kingdom of heaven is like. And I think Jesus told stories because it made hearing the hard truths a bit more palatable. The stories would turn what they knew about the world on, the head, on their head upside down, but it's told as a story, so it's kind of fun. From our story today, we get the question, is God fair? Is it fair that the person who only worked one hour gets paid the same amount as the one who worked all day? Is it fair that when they're leaving their shift, their hands aren't covered in grape juice and aren't cracked and drying out from the sun? We know the is it fair question. Is it fair when the slices of cake are slightly uneven? or when allowances change, or when the youngest child gets away with things that the oldest never would have? Is it fair where all my taxes go and who they support? It's not fair when someone else gets the promotion or the raise or succeeds when you haven't been able to or gets the, gets the acclimation that we're due. When we are not the winners of fair, when we labor, when the labor, when we are the laborer who got what he was told he would get, but not what he thought he had earned, it's not fair. The laborer understood the world in such ways, in ways of struggle and earning, of ownership and owed ship. And it's not so unlike the world we live in today. This past year, on the Democratic presidential debate stage, the topic inevitably turned to money. And in the midst of all of this, Chuck Todd asked billionaire Mike Bloomberg, is it too much? Have you earned too much money? Has it been an obscene amount? Should you have earned that much money? And Bloomberg replied, yes, I worked very hard for it. And the truth is, he probably did. But I was listening to a podcast, the podcast The Confessional this week, and the guest was Amber J. Phillips, and she said that if working hard would earn you billions, black people should never have to work a day again. She said, I knew for sure my mom was working hard, and I knew for sure we didn't have everything we needed. Because this is the way of the world. This is the world of the par that the parables was told in too, where we tell ourselves the lie that le wealth is accumulated by the wealthy and the poor remain poor because they didn't work for it. So maybe we should ask the question that isn't in the story, why are the workers still there at 5 p.m.? Why didn't anyone hire them? They're there waiting to be hired so it isn't because they're lazy or uninterested, but human labor was a commodity. And if they did not work, it's because someone didn't believe they were valuable. Maybe it's because they were the kind of people who are always picked last. The weak, the frail, the old, the disabled, the ones deemed less worthy, less valuable, less useful, the ones you might generally ignore. So maybe the question isn't, is God fair? Or is God unfair, but rather, are we? Are we unfair when we ignore others in need? 
Are we unfair when we treat God's good creation, human, animal, plant, land, air, as a commodity? When we put value on what the earth can do for us, on how creatures can serve us and how people can be useful? If we stay very close to the parable, the increase of wealth inequality that assumes that Bloomberg's eight-hour workday is far more valuable than yours or mine or the person at the grocery store or the one who cleans our homes or hotels that commodifies people, places a value on them, keeps them thinking that if they work harder this time, they'll succeed. And while that is the system we believe in, it's not the way it actually works. Like Amber J. Phillips said, the poor are some of the hardest working people, and yet there continues to be a growing gap between the wealthy and everyone else. And this increase of disparity has an effect on just about everyone's physical and mental health, safety, and yes, even the larger economy. And it turns out that greed is the primary destructive force on the planet and of the planet. In case you missed it, this last week, NPR's Planet Money did a deep dive on plastic recycling, and friends, it turns out we've all been had. They, the people in charge of the plastic and crude oil industries, knew that it isn't cost efficient and it isn't reasonable to, plast to recycle plastic. They knew, and yet they told us to recycle. They even put those triangles of our best intentions on all plastic. Even as we thought we were doing the right thing, they knew they weren't going to do anything about it. And so most of the packaging that we washed and recycled found its way into our landfills anyway. The bottom line, making new plastic would make money for the oil producers and the plastic industry, and it was good for their bottom line. Well, recycling was not, and so they didn't. And 30 years of our believing we were doing the right thing amounted to very little. And it isn't the greed of you and I, it is systemic, and it is industrial, and it is societal. It is the greed of the bottom line and the higher profits at the expense of everything else that is damaging our earth. For us, it is the cost of convenience. Are we willing to pay a little more, use a little less, raise our voices, demand something better? Are we willing to be inconvenienced if it means that there can be healing for the earth, if the earth can get what she needs when we know we have enough? It is greed that continues to rape the Earth's natural resources for energy instead of developing and advancing the means that could be sustainable. It is greed that clear cuts and overplants and overgrazes and overfertilizes when the land can inev inevitably not keep up and allows for runoff in the waterways, warming the oceans, killing the plants and the creatures. We could bring healing to the oceans and to the air that we breathe, if someone would farm more seaweed into the oceans, it would support the creatures and the coral and the CO2 reductions, but there is no economic incentive to do so, so no one does. Are we willing to give a little more to the earth of what she needs when we know we have enough? Mahatma Gandhi said, the world has enough for everyone's needs, but not enough for everyone's greed. And this is theological and ethical, but it is also true in economics too. There is enough. There is enough when we, like the Hebrews in the wilderness, collect the manna and the quail that showed up around them when we take just what we need and trust the earth and trust God for our daily bread there is truth in that story, because if they took more than they needed, it would spoil. And let's be honest, two of us hasn't collected too much food at the grocery store, only to pull it out rotten because we didn't know if we'd have enough when we bought it, or because we earned it, or because we can, and because we forgot it. 
The truth to the question is, no, God isn't fair. Not by the standards of the world that we live in, not by any standards we teach our children to understand the world around them. The kingdom of heaven isn't fair, but it is just. It notices the one who gets passed over. No one gets left behind. No one lives without their needs being met. None of creation is forgotten. In the kingdom of heaven, God loves abundantly, and there is enough. It honors the person, pers people, be persons because they are and not because of what they can do. It values creation because it is God's own and is filled with the divine spark, not because it is useful. The kingdom of heaven knows the needs it gives to the need and assures us of what we need. And church, we are called to be kingdom builders, which means we are supporting the needs of all of creation, of human and animal, plant and air, water and soil. It's not about fairness. It's about justice. Are we willing to let things be unfair? by the way the world works, if it means that there is justice for those who are neglected, ignored, denied, abused, used? Are we willing to let what we have be enough so that others can have what they need? Are we willing to say no so that someone else can have a yes? Are we willing to earn less so that others can earn what they need? Are we willing to give more so the earth can be healed? Are we willing to speak up, to advocate, to vote in a way that might be uncomfortable so that the earth can live in jubilee? Church, are we willing to say enough? As we enter into our time of prayer, Donna will share some music with us. You're welcome to use this time to reflect on any prayer concerns that you have. And if you're watching this on Facebook in the Sunday morning watch party, you're also welcome to share those concerns in the comment section. There are a number of prayer requests from the community um, for today. First of all, we ask for prayers for Pastor Stephen who was admitted to Oconomowoc Memorial Hospital on Monday with pancreatitis. He is expecting to have been discharged by the time of our service um, and is expecting a full recovery, but he's still in a bit of pain and would appreciate our prayers. Prayers also for the family and friends of Emily Albert's friend, Amanda, who passed away recently. Prayers for the family of Cindy Clark's sister, whose stepson Jamie died unexpectedly at the age of 45. Prayers for all of our teachers and staff, students, faculty, and parents, as school has begun in many forms. Continuing prayers as well for Helen Jonas, recovering from uh, spinal surgery, Sanjeev Cheda, Pat and George Miller's uh, daughter Anne and her her husband, Bill, Kathy Bublitz's son, JC, Chris Devitt's mother, Diane, Sherry Sambathaly and her wife, Karen, Jean Downey, Crystal Steinmate's boyfriend, sister-in-law, Lori, Kathy Grunewald, and Ann Bales.
As we prepare to join together in prayer, I invite you to take a breath and as you release it, to let go of all thoughts that may be preventing you from drawing closer to God. Heavenly and gracious God, there are so many things spinning in the world in front of us these days that it becomes hard to find a moment to settle our thoughts and hearts on your desires for our lives. Open our eyes to the pain and suffering of others, but also to the love and understanding that can be buried deep in the rhetoric of these times. We look out our windows to notice the sunshine or the gloom, and too often the window becomes a barrier between our lives and those around us. Help us to throw open the windows, to let the cool breeze into our space and our hearts, to remind us of the beauty that springs forth from each season that we experience. As the Israelites complain to Moses and Aaron, we often share our complaints with you, O God, not remembering that you are ever present in our lives and already know the troubles and the joys that we carry. Look deep into our hearts to see the love that sometimes fails to rise to the top amidst all that we see and experience. Be with the hundreds of thousands of people being displaced by the wildfires, those that are putting their lives on the line to fight to save land, homes, and people, and those whose lives have been lost in the consuming flames. Watch over the southeast coastline as the waters burst onto land, bringing destruction and more tragedy of loss. May we find ways to make meaningful responses to those left in great need of your love and care. Remind us amidst all that is happening of the gifts that we have before us in family, food, and shelter. In your ongoing desire for us to learn to honor and respect each other, no matter who we are or how we look or what we say, give us the capacity to tell the person standing before us that we love them as a child of God. Whether they speak your name or Allah, Yahweh, Great Spirit, Brahma, or another, help us to know that we are all welcome as people of faith and belief, working to see the world standing together in a spirit of understanding. Healing Christ, as you touch the bodies and the hearts of those needing to know your presence, gather with those in our community that are especially in need of you this day. Be with Pastor Stephen as he recovers at home, being supported by family and friends. Walk with Sanji and his family on his road of recovery. Comfort Pat Gima, Janet Dahl, Kathy Grunwald, and Ann Bales, that they may know your grace as their life road pulls them away from our presence in their lives. Help their families and friends to know we all walk the journey together. Be with those in our community who are experiencing illness and uncertainty through COVID-19. Help them to feel the supporting arms that this church family has to offer. Be with others in our community and in our lives, suffering the loss of someone close. Great Spirit, we are a people of community, of gathering, of sharing together, and in this time of necessary separation, we need your nearness even more. Remind us that your love is ours to have unconditionally, 
in these and all moments in our life. As we reach out to imagine holding hands with those who are praying with us today, let us share together the prayer that was given to us representing both our mother and our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join our cantor, Barbara Parkman, in singing our closing hymn, Change Our Hearts, O God. Beloved community, you have been blessed abundantly in ways that you may not even recognize. Go into your communities and into this beautiful world which we have been given. Love lavishly, give generously, and experience God anew in all you do. And know that God give, goes with you, Christ 
holds you up, and the Spirit helps your heart dance in delight. As you live out this blessing of your faith each moment. Amen.